Hey guys, welcome to The Disruptors, the show where we shift the way we think about today, tomorrow, and everything else that matters. I think we got somebody who's pretty much doing that right now. We got Seth Shostak on the line. That's It's a tough one to name, uh, to say, Seth. Where are you from originally? Where's the What's the history? Oh, well, I think the name comes from uh, Russia, actually, but uh, I was born in Virginia, and I grew up there. And what pulled you into space? What's... Pulled me into you space. have like the awesomest job ever. Let's let's be oh, honest here. I, I'm not sure of that, but maybe. Uh, what what drew me into space? I, I'm tempted to say dark energy, but in fact, uh, I was interested in astronomy as a kid. And I used to go to the planetary in New York and that sort of thing. And uh, you know, always always had an interest in the stars. Built a telescope at age ten. I don't think it's a very unusual story, to be quite honest. I think if you were to, you know, grab the next ten astronomers off the street. Probably not a good idea. But if you were to do that and ask them, well, how did you get interested in astronomy? They would have stories very similar to my own. Yeah, but the next 10 of them aren't you. You've, you've gone very far in the field and you've, you've gone deep into SETI, especially so the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Can you take me a little bit back into that story? And then I want to go a little further. Sure. Well, uh, actually, I think it began when I was a grad student. I mean, you know, as a kid, I was certainly interested in the idea of aliens. I, I went to the movies every week, and <laughs> and you very often would see the aliens come to Earth, usually with bad ideas, or maybe they were good ideas, but they had bad intentions. Uh, so aliens were something that I think every kid is interested in, to be quite honest. Uh, but then when I was in grad school, I was doing a thesis on radio astronomy, studying galaxies, and I read a book that had just come out. It was actually written by a Russian physicist, but it had been translated and edited, or at least edited, by Carl Sagan. And it pointed out that the equipment that I was using to study galaxies could also be used to maybe pick up a signal from space that would tell us that there were real aliens out there. That got me interested. I didn't do much about it until many years later uh, when I actually moved here to the Silicon Valley for completely different reasons. But uh, I was here for a while, and I got a phone call one day. I was here for about a year. And uh, it was from people here at the SETI Institute whom I knew. And they said, you want a job here. So that's how it happened. When did SETI get started? Well, it depends on what you mean by that. I mean, people were interested in the uh, idea of life in space for a very long time. I mean, you know, the classical Greeks were interested. They couldn't do much about it. Modern SETI, using equipment that might work, uh, began in 1960 uh, when Frank Drake, who, by the way, still works here, the SETI Institute, Frank Drake used an antenna in West Virginia to try and eavesdrop on signals coming from space. So that was the first modern SETI experiment. The SETI Institute, which is an organization, of course, uh, that was founded in 1984, so somewhat later. And that got, there was a lot of hype originally in the 60s, the 70s, 80s as well from the space race. Everybody was excited about space, and then it kind of died down for a little bit. Do you think, do you think what Elon's doing, what Jeff's doing, the, the pissing contest of billionaires is making it more interesting for people? Well, I hope so. Uh, I think you're right. I think that after we had gone to the moon, of course, the people who were interested in space, and that included NASA, to be quite honest, uh, were keen to go to the next obvious target, namely Mars. Now, Mars is a lot farther than the moon. It's more than 100 times farther, and it's a, it's a, it's a tough ride and all that. But uh, the, the cost of doing that back in you know the the late 1960s and the early 1970s, that was much too high. The Congress, you know, kind of balked at the at the cost estimates that NASA provided. Today, we have, uh, as you mentioned, Elon Musk uh, and, and uh, you know, these guys who are keen to do it as a private enterprise. That's great. I think that's terrific. It's hard. I, you know, you get the impression, oh, well, you know, we've already gone to the moon, so going to Mars is just a little bit more work. That's not quite true. It's it's much harder. And, and Mars, it looks great in the photos. You know, it kind of looks like Arizona, but it's a much tougher environment than Arizona. And you can't get any good Tex-Mex cuisine there either. Yeah, it's uh, it's one of those it's one of those uh, paradoxes that people don't think about enough when they think about space. That said, though, odds are there's something out there. What's that driving force for you? And how do you keep going? You've been at it for a while, and I know it's a tough. It's a tough search, but at the same time, there's ups and downs. What keeps you going? Well, I think it's the improvement in the technology that keeps me going, actually. Uh, you know, the search depends a lot on digital electronics, which is to say computers. And as a consequence, you know, we see an improvement in our ability to do a search that, uh, you know, that, that, that improvement is dramatic over the course of just a few years. 
It's, it's like computers, right? The laptop you buy today is a heck of a lot better than the laptop you bought five years ago. Five years, you know, the, your car isn't that much better than cars from five years ago, but your laptop is. Well, that rapid improvement in computer technology speeds up our search. So I think that to some extent, that's a motivational factor. The, the, the idea that, well, you know, the experiment a few years from now will be much better than anything we're doing now. So maybe the chances of success are greater. There's also the fact that we keep discovering planets, even planets that look kind of appealing, possibly habitable. That's something that uh, wasn't happening 30 years ago either. What are the odds if we do find life that'll be a planet versus a, a habitat that some other civilization has created, a Dyson, a Dyson sphere, a, a cylinder, et cetera? Well, cylinders you might be able to live into, in, you know, if they're rotating aluminum cylinders and you're on the inside and you, you spin it at just the right speed and you get the equivalent of one G of gravity. You know, that all, that all can work and that's probably our own future, actually. Uh, that they might be living on a Dyson sphere. A Dyson sphere or a Dyson swarm. Dyson swarm, I mean, sorry. Yeah, well, Dyson sphere, swarm. You know, it's just a, a method of collecting a lot of uh, uh, starlight so that you have the energy to power whatever it is you're going to do. Uh, I don't know that you would live on a Dyson swarm or a sphere. It, maybe you could. But the, the bottom line answer to your question is, personally, looking at what we're doing, what humans are doing, which is to say inventing thinking machines, I'm sure that the aliens have already done that. So I figure if we make contact with anything that we call intelligent, it's most likely to be a machine rather than some sort of biology. Just my opinion. Why do you think we haven't found any? There's There's so many potential solutions to the Fermi paradox, but all of them... All of them have issues. What's your what's your favorite idea or a couple? Well, they, you're right. They all have issues. So who knows? I mean, you know, it's it's a very, very big conclusion, namely that there's nobody out there based on a, a kind of a local observation. You know, we look around, we don't see any aliens, but that doesn't mean much. I mean, I don't see any uh, elephants here in the area, but that doesn't mean there aren't any elephants somewhere. Right. So I, I you know, I, I can't say that the logic is all that compelling just because you don't see aliens doesn't mean they're not there. I think that uh, the reason we haven't found them is basically we haven't done very much looking. Uh, despite the fact that SETI is an old endeavor, the effort has been very, very constricted by the limited funds. Uh, you know, it's all privately funded. There's no, uh, you know, the, the NASA's not doing SETI. So uh, I think that that has affected our ability to find something. I, I hope that will change. It's also the case that, as you point out, there are a million things you can think of that might explain it that don't get rid of the aliens, if you will. I mean, maybe the galaxy is kind of urbanized, you know, there are places where there are a lot more aliens than this place. And we're just in a, you know, a part of the galaxy that's not terribly interesting. That would be an interesting explanation for dark matter, actually. That was just a more advanced civilization's way of pushing away the barbarians so they didn't find someone. I've dark matter? I don't know how it keeps you from being found. Uh, dark matter is totally transparent. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of dark matter. There's dark matter everywhere in the universe we look, it seems. So I don't know if that's their project to con construct dark matter. Um, they've been very successful. <laughs> I'm, I meant more pushing, pushing things out of the way. At, oh. A essentially an anti-gravity type effect or an attraction type effect where you're able to pull. Uh, think about it. This isn't entirely technical. This is completely on the fly. But think about it like a magnet. If you have different people on a table and you slide a magnet underneath, you can move them away. Well, dark energy is a repulsive force. So maybe that's what you mean. Dark energy pushes things away. Dark matter does not push things away. It does attract. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, the attraction, I mean, there's dark energy in this room I'm sitting in, right? Not, there's also dark matter. And the dark matter is, you know, it's not doing much to me. You have to, <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's here, it's essential to the universe and probably very uh, essential to the formation of galaxies. But, um, you know, I, I got to say my, my run to the grocery store is not terribly affected by dark matter. And this is why I'm not an astrophysicist. Very, very good point. What are what are some of the some of the more interesting things that have happened while you've been at SETI? Well, <laughs> there's always something interesting because there's always something new, right? Most of the scientists here, in fact, are not doing SETI. They're doing what's called astrobiology. So they're interested in life in space, but they're interested in life that you might find in our solar system, uh, for example, on Mars. But there are six other places besides Mars in our solar system where you might have biology. Now, that biology is very likely to be single-celled organisms, so, you know, microscopic stuff. Uh, you know, the InSight lander, you know, plopped down onto Mars yesterday. It's not looking for life, 
Uh, it's, you know, trying to understand what the interior of Mars is like. You know, does it have a molten core? Does it have a, you know, whatever? Does it have a lot of magma? Does that, what, what is it like? And you might say, well, well, what does that have to do with aliens? And the answer is nothing much directly. It's actually not looking for biology, but it's going to tell you how planets are formed, or at least help you, you know, understand how planets are formed. And that gives you some insight into planets that might have oceans and atmospheres and things like that, which are the kinds of planets that you hope uh, might be inhabited. And realistically, if we start to find bacteria, et cetera, then you can kind of extrapolate from there. If life's happening other places, there's probably, very probably intelligent life happening, unless there's some type of filter. Well, I mean, it is controversial. If you uh, grab, uh, instead of grabbing those astronomers, grab some evolutionary biologists and say, okay, I'll give you a million worlds with uh, life. They've all got, you know, bacteria, which is what Earth had for the first 80% of the history of life here. Only bacteria. Billions of years, only bacteria, right? Bacteria are pretty good at surviving. Uh, well, do you think most of them will cook up intelligent life eventually or not? And the answer is going to vary because uh, while there are people, that, that include me, by the way, that think that eventually you get to intelligence simply because intelligence has so much survival value. But there are plenty of other people saying, well, maybe not. I mean, you know, Homo sapiens has been around for 200,000 years. That isn't very long, really. The dinosaurs were around for 150 million years, and they weren't getting intelligent. I mean, they weren't writing poetry, right? right. Uh, but they were perfectly good design for survival, and, you know, Darwinian evolution is only interested in survival, it seems. So, uh, you know, maybe there are just lots and lots of worlds with life, but intelligence is very rare. That could be. We won't know until we are if and if we find something, we'll know more. Until that time, all we can say is, well, I think that intelligence will develop, but not sure. Part of, part of what the, the evolutionary theory has got to take into account as well is the dynamic stability. So if you have an apex predator destroying everything else, i.e. a climate change, uh, lions that are able to catch too much prey, etc. You can almost hunt yourself extinct. So if you have less intelligent creatures, it might not be the best survival mechanism for an individual, but overall, if you look at the dynamics, it would be interesting to see if evolution is purely optimizing for longevity or for survival aspects versus overall survival aspects. Does that make sense? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe what you're asking is, does evolution select for intelligence? Uh, it's not clear that it does. It certainly selects for survival, right? The bacteria are great at surviving. They're not very intelligent. Uh, in fact, you could say that of almost all the species around. There are a couple of species that are fairly intelligent, actually, and they've done all right. Uh, an apex predator that uh, destroys its prey, it has also destroyed itself. So, you know, nature doesn't really select for that. That isn't so good. If you hunt to extinction <laughs> your dinner, uh, that's not good for you, is it? So they may not do that. But intelligence does offer you some flexibility. And when conditions change rapidly, for example, you have ice ages and so forth, you know, and may, maybe being a little cleverer than that critter over there might mean that you eat and it doesn't. So, you know, that, that may mean that you're selected for. Intelligence may be something that is the result of a, kind of a, I don't know, a competitive environment. Yeah, it's it's interesting to consider and try to rewind history, so to speak. How do you think about panspermia? Do you give it any credence? Well, it's an interesting idea that's been around for hundreds of years, actually. The idea that life might go from one world to another. Uh, in its modern incarnation, that would be in a rock, right? If you had life on Mars four billion years ago, say, before there was life on Earth. Um, and uh, some rock slams into Mars, which happens all the time, kicks off a dirt clod, most of which just falls right back to Mars, but some of that dirt might be kicked off fast enough to leave Mars altogether, wander around the solar system, by chance hit the Earth and infect the Earth, and we're all descended from the bacteria in that dirt clod, so we're all Martians in a way. Uh, that could be. I mean, it doesn't violate anything we know. It's, it's certainly possible, and, and single-celled organisms can stay in a rock or a dirt clod for you know hundreds of thousands of years and still be viable if they're in a dormant state. And, you know, single-celled uh, critters can do that. Suspended animation is for them something they can do. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, that could be. But if you're talking about panspermia, where we get infected by life from another uh, star system, not just from Mars. Mars is, you know, it's only 35 million miles away. But if you're talking about another star system, which is, you know, 35 trillion miles away or 25 trillion miles away at least, right, 
then it's in that this this rock or this dirt cloud is in space for so long uh, that uh, it, it seems like everything in it would be sterilized by the radiation in space, the lack of water, etc. What if it was intentional? So when when a species when let's say humanity was going to die, what we do we get everything that we can. We try to get as many species of plants, animals, etc. We do the we do the Noah's Ark, so to speak. But we do it genetically. We store test tubes and then we try to ship those off to different colonies to restart. Would that would that be a possible a possible scenario? Well, I think it's certainly a possible scenario. No need to send the test tubes, by the way. You just send the bits, right? You don't 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 send the matter. You just send the genetic code, right? <laughs> That you can send at the speed of light. The test tubes you can't send at the speed of light. So you just, you know, sort of send a, a laser signal or a radio wave or something. And Oh, by the way, here's the genetic code of humans. And you could transmit that in, you know, less than an hour easily. Uh, so, you know, in a sense, now we've immortalized Homo sapiens. And we'll just do that with all the other species, too. We'll just have this, you know, multi-year broadcast from Earth, which is the Noah's Ark of what's alive on this planet. You can do that. But the problem is at the other end right what's at the other end to pick this up record these data and maybe you know put them into some device that's going to reconstruct uh, an organism with this dna that's that, that's what i meant what would be the odds that not that but the inverse we were the result of a different civilization a different species sending out their escape pods so to speak of bacterial forms to try to propagate the universe propagate oh, yeah, the yeah, yeah, it's sort of Johnny Appleseed that they actually sent, you know, Bingo. bacteria to Earth in a rocket. Yeah, that's been suggested by either Watson or Crick, one of the two guys who, you know, figured out the structure of DNA, uh, you know, directed panspermia, it's called, which is to say it's deliberate. And somebody wants to uh, uh, have their life form, you know, all over the place. And so they build a whole bunch of rockets and send them with <laughs> with something that when it crashes and lands, reproduces. Billions uh, of Donald Trump clones. Filling the galaxy. Yeah, well, yeah but you can, it's, it's hard to send a very complicated, uh, uh, you know, organism to begin with. You got to, you know, decide, are you going to keep it alive? Bacteria, you could keep alive probably a lot easier. But not only that, if you had, you know, you sent homo sapiens or for that matter, crocodiles or whatever, uh, you know, what are they going to eat when they get here? There's nothing for them to eat. Whereas bacteria, they don't require much in the way of food stuff. They can, you know, work on rock, wet rock. <laughs> so, so you can probably count on that. But, uh, you know, maybe maybe so. It's a very big project to do that. Um, costs a lot of money, and I don't know if the aliens, uh, you know, really want to do it. But, and it also, by the way, takes time. It depends on how fast their rockets are. But if their rockets are comparable to our rockets, you know, it, it takes hundreds of thousands of years minimum to send something to a nearby star. So, uh, you know, I, I'm not saying nobody could do it. I'm just saying it's not easy. Oh, definitely not. It was more of a devil's advocate spreading the tentacles out uh, type concept. So big picture science, you host the pretty popular podcast. How did that happen? And how do we improve science's standing in the world today? Because there's so many people that are pushing back against technology and progress. Well, there are people who are uh, kind of uh, against some of the findings of science. There's some obvious examples of that. But big picture science actually began uh, more than a decade ago now. Uh, there was one of our board members thought uh, that uh, having a radio show might be a great way to get uh, support for the SETI Institute, or money for that matter. It's not a great way to get money, I can tell you that. You probably know that. But uh, it certainly has been fun. And we were doing it in the beginning very in a very simple way, uh, just from my house, actually. It was in my den. I had a setup with an ISDN line. I think those are all technical matters. But uh, it was put on a satellite. There were like 25 stations in very small communities in the United States who would carry the show. It was live, and I would just interview somebody every day, every day, every week, every Sunday. But doing a live show is actually quite hard because then you've got to be there every t every week at the same time. Whereas a produced show, you don't have to be there. But beyond that, you can make the show as good as you want to by spending more time on it. Okay, so that's how Big Picture Science is produced now. We still do one show a week. But we we produce the show over a couple of days where we spend uh, effort in getting the interviews, editing them and so forth. And today, the distribution model is quite different. Uh, we're on what are we like 144 stations or something. And uh, of course, there's a podcast download, Big Picture Science, so people can find it. Uh, but the idea here 
I, I don't want to talk about, you know, the carriage and all that so much. It sounds like bragging. But the thing that's interesting to me about it is, A, that it, we can be creative. We, we use humor a lot. We sometimes have skits and stuff like that. But beyond that, it's bringing science to, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Front Porch in a way that they, I hope, find interesting. And that's incredibly important because, like we were saying a little bit before, and it ties into that, the space race, there was nothing cooler than being an astronaut. I mean, if you were to sell an astronaut calendar, that would be the top selling thing that would outsell everything out there. But these days, people are more excited about the next cell phone. And that that's kind of sad. Well, well, all right. Uh, as soon as this is, uh, interview is over, I'm going over to the local uh, cell phone store and get something. Uh, oh, you, 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 missed, you missed Cyber Monday. What happened? Yeah, well, I slept through it. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't need another phone. <laughs> but, well, I, I don't know. It's true what you say, that people are not as excited about space as they once were. On the other hand, I, I just wonder whether that isn't only a consequence of the fact that what's been done in space since we landed on the moon uh, with some exceptions, has been, you know, seeing astronauts in the space station, you know, juggling their food in zero G and so forth. And that's interesting at first, but eventually it's not so interesting. The public can't get into the science experiments particularly. They're very specialized and, you know, science is not so accessible in general. So maybe that's part of it. I think that that's about to change. To begin with, the public is interested in space, I think. Uh, look at all the the attention paid to the landing of the InSight, uh, 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 it's, not a, it's not a rover, it's just a lander, right? It's a device that just sits in one spot on the, on the red planet. But there was a lot of excitement in watching that thing actually get down onto the surface of Mars. People are interested in space, I believe, I believe as many as ever were, but they need some projects that are, uh, that are interesting to them and not just the same thing every week. What would happen to humanity, to society, to how we think about everything if we did discover intelligent life? Well, that's hard to say. I mean, normally when you ask sociologists or historians or anybody else about that sort of thing, you know, they'll, they'll look for an historical analog. They'll say, well, finding life in space would be like, and then fill in the blank, and the blank fill in is usually, well, maybe Darwin's publishing of Origin of Species, when suddenly we understood something completely different. Maybe Columbus discovers America, right, that kind of thing, although he himself wasn't even aware of the discovery. So I don't know. But there is no real good historical, you know, example you can point to and say, oh, this will be completely parallel to what would happen if we were to find life in space. A lot of people that I talk to think that if we were to pick up a signal tonight or next, next week or whenever, uh, that we wouldn't even tell them that the government would shut it all down and keep it secret which I find an astounding <laughs> thing for them to say. Uh, and I always ask, well, why? Why would they do that? And they say, oh, well, the public couldn't handle the news. They'd go nuts. <laughs> well, even aside from the fact that many people are nuts, uh, I, I think that that's nutty. I mean, it's totally nutty. If, you, if we found life in space, of course we would tell everybody. We'd have to tell everybody, actually. There's no way to keep it secret. But, uh, I, I, you know, I've talked to a lot of people. I say, would you stay home from work if you uh, heard the news that we'd found a signal, or would you go to work anyhow? They'd all go to work. I don't think they'd be rioting in the streets. It depends on if we found a signal or if we found a signal headed towards us. There could be uh, some different implications. The uh, the biggest thing I think would be would just be dispelling the billions of individuals' beliefs around the world in in religion and as human being special in some way. I think that could be very beneficial over the long term, but very very catastrophic over the short term. Well, it might be. It might be disruptive. And again, if you consider Darwin, you know, that continues to be disruptive because there are people who do not want to. I mean, like half the American public it has its doubts about uh, evolution, uh, you know, even though it's it's been established for 150 years that it's the way biology works. There are people who have, you know, they just have moral, religious objections. And, and maybe that would happen, <coughs> excuse me, with the discovery of life in space. Because there are people who think, you know, the only intelligent beings have to be humans. We're the, you know, the best that nature has to offer. So it would be humbling. It would be humbling. But we've hum we've been humbled before. I mean, you know, I, I honestly don't think that uh, there's going to be widespread uh, unhappiness. There will be some groups that will be unhappy. There are always some groups that are unhappy with any new discovery. The hippies would love it. That would be sure. We'd have a we'd have a new love fest. What uh what technologies and industries outside of space are you most excited or interested in? Well, I have a lot of interests, unfortunately. 
unfortunately for me. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, obviously I'm interested in technology. I mean, here in the Silicon Valley, you can't avoid it if you're just sitting at a, you know, at a Denny's having lunch. The, the, the people next to you are talking tech. Uh, so, you know, you develop an interest in that. But I was always interested in electronics and stuff like that. So I, I enjoy that. Uh, I worked for the railroads in the past. So I'm uh, often uh, uh, compelled to uh, to look into transportation issues. I pay attention to those. Uh, movies, you know, I consult for films, but I, I used to make films when I was much younger. So, you know, I have a lot of interests. Uh, I have to say of the places to be, if you have so many interests, uh, California is not a bad place. Definitely not a bad place, especially considering the political climate. So you, you made movies. What did you make movies of? Well, we start off making uh, science fiction films. This is when I was 11 years old, actually. But people laughed at them. So we figured if they were going to laugh, we would make comedies. And that's what we made mostly. Satires, parodies, that sort of thing. We made a film <laughs> it's in the 1960s, I guess it was. It was called The Teenage Monster Blob from Outer Space, which I was. Starred six pounds of Play-Doh. Um, yeah, in fact, we showed it at a party and, you know, people were kind of bored. And so my buddy with whom I made the film said, look, Chostak, uh, if people are, you know, he should, <laughs> if people are going to be bored with this film, I mean, this film is a turkey. And I said, well, if it's a turkey, Bob, I tell you what, why don't we just make a film that actually is a turkey, deliberately a turkey, and let's not make the whole film. Let's just make the trailer, the coming attraction. And uh, so that's what we did. We made the turkey that ate St. Louis. And uh, that was a little more successful, maybe because it was only three minutes long. You were like 50 years early. That's YouTube. So yes. th th we uh, were making the turkeys. Where um, where would you be if we got a signal? What would you react? You said going to work, not going to work. You, you've been doing this a while. What would your reaction be? Well, I actually know that because we've done that experiment. Or that experiment was done to us, depending on how you look at it, back in 1997. So that's 20 years ago. Uh, I got a call. It was dinner time, and I got a call from the boss here at the Institute saying I ought to get down to the the office, which I did. And uh, everybody was looking at the computers because we had picked up a signal that looked like the real deal. And for most of the day, it looked like the real deal. So uh, I kind of know what would happen because it happened once. And, you know, we were, I would say, 70 percent sure that it was really E.T. on the line. <coughs> Excuse me. And it turned out not to be, by the way. But it took a day to figure that out. So in all that time, you know, we were all thinking, this is it. And my own reaction, kind of puzzling, really, but maybe not, was to think of very trivial things. I was worried about the fact that, well, next week I've got these luncheons planned and I'm supposed to go to dinner with and I've got all this work stacked up and I'm supposed to write this and so forth. And I'm worried that this is going to disrupt my week. And then I think about <coughs> I think about it a little bit longer. All these fires in California. I've only been coughing for three weeks. Uh you know, I, I I was thinking this might not just disrupt my week. This might disrupt the whole year <laughs> or more. <laughs> right. So that that was kind of a dismaying thing. Uh, obviously, I was waiting for uh, to see if the red phone would ring, uh, you know, connecting us directly to the White House. Well, it turns out we didn't have a red phone. Uh, and then I figured, you know, eventually somebody will call the government, maybe the Pentagon, somebody, uh, maybe the mayor of Mountain View where we are. Uh, nobody called. Uh, my relatives didn't call. Nobody called. But actually, about nine hours into it, maybe a little more, more like uh, 12 or 15 hours into it, the phone finally did ring. And it was one of the science writers in The New York Times. They already knew about it. And so I talked to them and I said, we'll call you back because there's some suspicion that this is maybe not E.T. And within a, an hour or two, we did know that it wasn't E.T. I called them back and they didn't run with the story. But that was a really good dry run, you know, a t a test drive, if you will, of what it would be like if we picked up a signal. And, it, you know, you don't expect it. You're a little dismayed by it. And nobody seems to be interested. Subconsciously, it's kind of like your purpose, your reason for being, your reason d'etre or whatever the French say is, is gone. You've done it. You've succeeded. Now what? Is that kind well, of the feeling? Well, no, it wasn't so much that. Uh, I was nervous. I mean, you know, if you, you make the discovery, then great. You made the discovery. Terrific. Uh, it's true that at that point, you know, many, many other people will get involved. There'll be real money to support it. As one of my colleagues said, they'll, they'll get smart people to do this kind of thing. Uh, he was very smart, by the way. So uh, I, I found that kind of, uh, kind of puzzling. But, yeah, of course, that would change everything. I mean, it's like making any discovery once you've done it. 
hey, what if your name is Röntgen and you, you know, you discover X-rays? All right. Well, you know, that that changes the world and you don't see a lot of it. But, you know, it's it isn't that you at that point either consider your life is now the rest of your life is now worthless or you just go to the French Riviera and relax. I mean, you know, it's it's just something that happened. What wave types are we searching for? I know a lot of the search centers around radio waves. And then what are the odds that if we did somehow there were advanced civilizations out there that they would be using more primitive types of technology like radio? Well, I, I don't know why you think radio is primitive. Uh, are you referring to the content? Just in terms of if we've figured it out already, odds are there's probably a better way of doing it that we haven't could, figured out yet. Could be, but I often point to the wheel, right? And that was figured out a long time ago now, thousands of years at least. Uh, have we figured out a better thing than the wheel to put on our vehicles to run around on the on the ground or on prepared geography like a you know, macadam or rails or something like that. We still use the wheel. I bet we'll always use the wheel. So radio is just another form of light, electromagnetic radiation. And electromagnetic radiation has several advantages. You can put a lot of bits onto it and send information. It uh, goes at the speed of light, which according to Al Einstein is the best you can do. And it's very easy to generate and to receive. So, um, you know, I, I don't know that it'll go away. And to say that it's primitive just means that from our point of view, it's an old technology, old being 100 years, which, of course, in the grand scheme of things is very, very new. But, you know, I, I don't know what else the aliens might have. They might have, you know, some physics that allows some some faster form of communication. But uh, again, you know, Einstein says that you can't have it faster than the speed of light simply because that causes real problems in physics causality and stuff like that so it's unclear whether you get something that's faster than the speed of light and if you don't then you know radio or light which is basically the same thing are good ways to send bits which of all of the fermi solutions you've heard do you find the most reasonable the most likely if you had to pick one well i think that the reason we haven't found the aliens is simply because we haven't done much of a search and that's uh, that's a money issue mostly uh, we haven't had the ability to do big searches. Now, I hope that that will change. It's already changed a little bit because uh, Yuri Milner, a Russian billionaire here, uh, has uh, helped fund the SETI uh, effort at the University of California at Berkeley. So, you know, they're, they're doing a, a very comprehensive experiment. Maybe that'll that'll succeed. Uh, as far as the Fermi paradox, as I mentioned, one, one explanation that I kind of like is the idea that the galaxy is urbanized. But the other thing is, remember... If the majority of the intelligence in the cosmos is synthetic, if it's machines, then you know it's not very easy to find machines in space. I mean, they don't have to stay on a planet. They'll only rust on a planet. They probably get off the planet, go some, somewhere where there's more energy. Um, and, and uh, you know, they, they have very little incentive to kind of make their presence known with anything they do. I mean, you can imagine things like that. And we have just a very, very primitive understanding of what true intelligence might do. It'd be like, I don't know, the trilobites 300 million years ago sitting around at the bottom of the ocean thinking, ah, oh, man, there's probably some, you know, some aliens out there. They're probably sitting in their ocean wondering what it's all about. Kind of a limited point of view. <laughs> it is a limited point of view. What would it take? Would there be a way to get more funding and money on board? Could you have a competition between Bezos and Musk and all of these guys for, for funding? How could we make this a bigger public issue? Well, I think that's a, uh, that's a very germane and good question. Unfortunately, I don't know a good answer to it. I think that Yuri Milner's original intent was, in fact, not to fund uh, the research, but to make a competition. Uh, and he knows many of these uh, people that you name and uh, see if he could get them interested. They were interested in maybe funding the research, but having a competition. The trouble is, you know, to get into the game in a serious way, to actually be able to do an experiment, that makes sense scientifically and has some chance of success, I think, uh, requires that you have, you know, either some big antennas or big mirrors if you're thinking of, you know, looking for lasers and stuff like that. It requires some investment in equipment. It's not ex exclusively the case that only somebody with money can get into this, but you do need, in general, you need some money. It's like, hey, why doesn't everybody else look for the Higgs boson? Why is it only these guys in Europe? Well, it's because they have the machine to do it. And it's very hard for anybody else to get that machine. So it's, you know, it's it's nice to say, well, we'll just have a competition and whoever finds E.T. first gets 100 bucks. I don't know that that would stimulate a whole lot of serious research. 
It wouldn't, but it'd be interesting if you gave them the opportunity to fund SETI for a year and every year you had a new donor. And then essentially when you found, or if you found something, the donor would be remembered as the one who funded the project who found ET. Yeah. Well, I recommend then, uh, Matt, that uh, you you come to the Institute. We'll put you in charge of this project. Uh, get, in, get, get in touch with these guys and present your plan to them. It, it might work. It's a lot easier to get money here in the Silicon Valley if you say your reward will be, you know, profits, <laughs> because th that's something very tangible that they can understand. If you say your reward will be to be written up in textbooks for the next next 200 years, uh, some will go for that, I'm sure. But it, but it's hard. Funding is surprisingly hard. It is. It is the major problem. It's the problem we have as well, being self-funded by by listeners. What uh, what are you most worried about? Technologies trends today. Well, I think that the. I mean, there are a lot of things you could say. I'm I'm worried about this. I'm worried about this. You could worry about biotech, uh, you know, because biotech has the capability of releasing all sorts of interesting organisms into the environment that maybe you don't want. Uh, there's the the, the designer baby. Uh, possibility that's already in the news. Uh, the, the thing is, you know, you could worry about nuclear weaponry and so forth, but to build a, a, a bomb, you know, that's not something you're going to do in your basement, right? You can't separate out the fissile uh, materials and all that sort of thing. It, it, it takes a huge infrastructure to become uh, threatening in, in terms of you know, nuclear weaponry, for example. But to do some biotech, you know, you just need a hacker space in your town. Or, in fact, you can do it in your basement if you're willing to go on eBay and buy all this used equipment. You can do that yourself. And there are plenty of hobbyists that are doing this. Could they make a virus that could, you know, cause a pandemic? Well, apparently they could. So, you know, you could worry about that. Uh, for some reason, I don't worry about it too much. The other big thing that we're doing in this century that does worry me is the development of artificial intelligence. Because uh, you can say, oh, well, we'll just make sure that they're always friendly to humans. Well, yeah, I mean, the first generation probably will be. But then very quickly, you have the machines design their next generation, right? So they're reproducing on their own, if you will. You may still have to have a wrench to put things together. But very quickly, the machines are deciding what's going to be in the next generation of machines. And their interests may have nothing to do with the interests of Homo sapiens. I don't know where that leads but in any case, we don't have control over it. Yeah, it seems extreme hubris to assume you can control something more intelligent than yourself that becomes more intelligent more quickly than you do. Yep, I find, I, do yeah, it's the, Zuck, it's the Zuckerberg thought. Um, in terms of, in terms of, if you wanted to leave people with something, I know you're a busy guy. You've got a lot going on. If you wanted to leave people with something, a quote, a call to action, what would it be and why? Well, listen, you know, I could be sort of. Uh, I don't know, self-promoting and say, why don't you, uh, you know, help us, help us out with our research or for that matter, our radio show, whatever. I, I hope some people will do that. I really do. But I think the bigger message for me always is, you know, science sounds intimidating. It's not like it was 150 years ago when you, if you were a person of leisure, for some reason you, you know, were a trust fund baby or something, you know, you could do science. There was all sorts of science just sort of lying around stuff that you could pick up and figure out with a, you know, a couple of days in the library, you could become an expert at almost any subject in science. That's not true today. Science is quite a bit harder now. And uh, you, know, you can't, as an individual, necessarily you know, pick up anything <laughs> all that interesting. It's harder. They work in teams. You need sophisticated equipment. You need you know, degrees on the wall, not because they cover up the holes in the wall. You need degrees on, on the wall because to do science, you need a certain minimum level of, of uh, education that's you know not very minimal. Uh, but everybody can understand how science decides whether things are true or not true, or at least likely to be true or unlikely to be true. The scientific method, method is very simple to understand, and most science results are actually not hard to understand. And uh, I, I would encourage them to realize that science is a great way to to actually establish what's going on in the cosmos, not just astronomy, obviously, but what's going on everywhere, including human behavior. And so science is maybe the best way we have for, for deciding truth, whatever that word may mean. And it would be better if uh, you know more people were sort of following it and not put off by the fact that it's hard. Definitely. I could not agree more. I think part of the problem with science is how it's presented. 
it, it, there's a flaw in human nature where we believe the person who seems more true, uh, more certain of themselves. So if you're certain of yourself as or a fool, or you're certain of yourself and you're lying, either of those come across better than the scientist that says there's a 99.9% chance. But we might find out something that disproves this. I think that's a I think that's a problem that too many people are willing to point to and say, okay, I can stick my head in the sand and pretend like I didn't hear that because they're not totally sure yet. Yeah, well, that's true. I mean, science has a problem uh, convincing people of things that they have some other reason not to want to believe. You you would prefer to believe somebody who's telling you what you already believe. I mean, that's very well known. And uh, that that means if, if you're talking to somebody who, I don't know, doesn't believe in climate change, doesn't think that's well established, or doesn't believe in evolution, or thinks that vaccines cause autism or stuff like that. I mean, you got all the science on your side, but what you really need on your science uh, on your side is their willingness to not just hear you lecture to them, but to understand why it is that you're saying it. And uh, that that's a harder sell. I mean, science popularization, if you want to call it that, uh, conveying science to the public, addressing the problems of science literacy, literacy that's that's like apple pie and motherhood. People have been uh, you know touting this as a great thing to do for a long time, certainly since when I was a kid. When Sputnik went up, uh, you know, there was a great push by the federal government to get more science education in the schools. That was actually a very good initiative. They did that. Uh, and I, I think it uh, I think it paid off, to be quite honest. But the facts are that despite all these decades of trying to do this, uh, you know, there's still the, the fraction of people who are skeptical about many things that are long established in science is just as high as it ever was. So I don't know. I don't know what I'm telling you to do, Matt. Maybe consider a job in, uh, you know, transmission repair. Yeah, I got my telescope out. I can see you because it's flat between here and there. Seth, where's the best place for people to find you if they want to learn more about you, about big picture, about everything that you're working on? Well, I mean, obviously, you can just go to the SETI Institute uh, website, SETI.org. I have my own website. I think it's, well, I'm not sure. It's Seth Shostak. Just do a search on that. And uh, then the guy, I never go to my own website. but, But, you know, you could. And big picture science is just bigpicturescience.org. So any of those. Or just do a Google search. Maybe you'll find something interesting. I know that many people do, and they write me abusive emails. Well, there's always going to be haters, but the, the, the positive ones you don't hear from as much. As long as people are reacting, you know they're at least seeing what you're doing. At least they're paying attention. That's yeah. right. Awesome. Thanks for coming on today, Seth. And guys, check it out. Seth is one smart dude, and he's got a lot to add to the conversation. Hope you've Thank enjoyed. You. Yeah. Cheers. Bye, Matt. Thank you very yeah. much. See you, Seth. Bye-bye. Bye.